Welcome to Tech Empire. I'm Michael Quet, and I'm joined by Siamo Malachi. Today we have on the show, James Muldoon. James is a senior lecturer in political science at the University of Exeter and head of digital research at the Autonomy Think Tank. He is the author of numerous books, including most recently, Platform Socialism, How to Reclaim Our Digital Future from Big Tech. James, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me on. All right, so today we're going to talk about platform socialism. We're going to cover what is wrong with platform capitalism and how we might redesign the platform economy with ideas about platform socialism. So this is uh, based you know, largely off of James's new book, and we're just going to um, dig through it and see what he, what he thinks about these things. Tech Empire is part of the Yale Podcast Network and can be found on SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, in YouTube. On Twitter, visit at Tech Empire Cast. All right, so let's start with the basic question. Uh, what are platforms and what is wrong with today's platform economy? So I define platforms primarily as value capture devices. I think their main role in today's platform economy is to appropriate in some way the value creating activity of their users. Um, and so the way they do this is often acting as some kind of intermediary, um, as a gatekeeper of digital markets. I think the real kind of innovation of platforms is trying to get other people to do the work for you. So rather than kind of offering a good or a service to market, you kind of position yourself more as like a middle person, um, trying to connect people, trying to skim a little bit off the top of transactions. Um, and so this real power that many of the digital platforms today exercise um, is primarily acting as this kind of gatekeeper figure. Um, now, I think this kind of poses both new problems for us, but it also raises new opportunities as well. Um, so I think in terms of the problems, obviously there is going to be a lot of unfair practices in how these gatekeepers operate in digital markets. But it also kind of really highlights the essential fact that the platforms are, are simply not that essential, right? It's, it's our labor, it's our activity, it's our social lives together that is the true source of value. And I think it's kind of important to keep that in mind when we're talking about these platforms, that the kind of software that they offer is something that is potentially replicable, it's replaceable, it's the kind of thing that we could potentially run ourselves. Um, so while we spend more of our lives online, um, and more of our lives can be, you know, taken up in these processes of datafication um, and the platforms kind of own and run the social infrastructure of everyday life. Um, I think it's, you know, really telling that there are possibilities for us to, to, to create a different kind of platform economy. Yeah, could we get some examples maybe of some of these prominent platforms? Does this have to be an explicit process of appropriation? Or is appropriation kind of written into the entire digital tech empire that we're seeing right now? Well, I think what you see, for example, with Facebook's move to meta and the metaverse in general is really a, a, quite a, a strong, striking example of this kind of appropriative activity. Because what you see in Facebook's business model is that it's essentially an advertising business, right? At the moment, that the whole aim of the game is to create these this digital world in which people are just kind of living their lives. Um, and it's not so much the transaction fees or the subscription fees, because obviously Facebook is a free service. It's all of the consumer insight that is actually harvested by the company when people are just going about their daily business. And I think the move to the metaverse is really telling of the kind of direction the company wants to go in. Because what you see here with the kind of concept as it's been developed is that they really want to expand this world much, much more. They want to create this new hybrid online, offline world where almost everything we do would give the company the chance both to harvest data from us, to, to kind of sell to advertisers, but also potentially to create new revenue streams so that, you know, when we're buying or selling merchandise that Facebook or, or now Meta will take a cut, um, when we're booking a holiday, when we're talking to friends, the idea, I think, is that the, 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 the companies basically want to fall into the background so that they're, they're not even a kind of service that we choose. They're just 
the imperceptible medium upon which we live our lives, that they're just kind of in the background, they're taking a cut of everything that happens. And I think um, the way in which that takes place is, is through these extremely extractive forms of business models where value is constantly taken from the users. Now, uh, you talk in your book about monetizing community um, and enclosing the commons. Uh, could you could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, well, monetizing community, it was actually the original title for the book when it was a slightly different form. I had originally kind of um, honed in on this um, emerging discourse in, in the tech world about how community became really central to some of the biggest tech um, platforms basically around like 2015, 2016 onwards. Um, and I think this idea of monetizing online communities is really central to their business model. And um, the, the CEO of, of Airbnb um, has this really famous saying that he wants to, you know, the, the community is the product. Um, and I think this is, this is really such an important idea for, for many of these tech companies. Um, and one of the ways in which they do this is through selling themselves as global community builders. So, you know, around the Trump election, when things started to get even more polarized, both in American society and globally, um, with the rise of populism, um, both left and right, and new forms of kind of nationalism and xenophobia, um, the companies really tried to rebrand themselves. And that was in the wake of the, the tech lash, um, a lot of research coming out about the negative effects of these companies and the negative impact they were having on communities. And they started to pitch this, this feel-good story of the role that their products were playing um, enabling new forms of social life. So the company started to see themselves as, as, you know, leaders in this move towards creating new online communities. Um, and so I called, the, I called this idea community washing, right? That it's effectively a marketing strategy um, of framing their business through the language of community empowerment um, and fulfilling a social mission. Because I think the reality is that you know, often the, the actual practices of these companies um, entail very destructive forms of engagement with communities. They often involve extracting value from them um, and a lack of concern for the kind of impact they're having on real communities, particularly if we think of the example of, um, of Airbnb, where you see gentrification, over-touristification, um, and really a sense of like neglect for the actual communities in the real world, Airbnb's community is this kind of uh, emerging entrepreneurial homeowning middle-class uh, coalition that they're trying to mobilize both against regulators um, and against opponents of the company. So I think that's essentially what we're seeing is, is a very cynical PR campaign um, because when these companies were first formed, you know, in the early 2010s um, and late 2000s, no one was talking about community back then, right? Facebook was a database. Airbnb was, was basically a, a small idea that someone had. Um, and what is really noticeable is that um, the mission of these companies is kind of developed along the way. And it's precisely after the company gets into serious trouble that it starts concocting these ideas to try and polish their image, to try and say, um, you know, all this critical scrutiny we're, we're receiving um, actually, you know, if you think about it from another point of view, we're, we're one of the good guys. Um, and I think framing the, the problems in terms of problems of the community allows them to sidestep criticism, right? Because if it's just the community coming together, trying to solve their collective problems, well, no one's really to blame for that. People are doing the best they can. You know, the, the companies are always working on it. They're always like, oh yeah, we, we think this is terrible. We're, we're trying our hardest. Because if you're part of a community, Community, um, you don't see a fundamental antagonism between a bunch of capitalists trying to make money and the people they're exploiting. You just see a bunch of community leaders doing their best. And so all of this language of, you know, social mission, um, global community, it's both a way of framing their mission, but also kind of avoiding some of the criticisms and conflicts um, that are emerging. Yeah. And uh you know, you brought up uh, the concept of washing, right? We hear that word a, a lot these days. And 
I mean, from my perspective, if we were to look at this tech lash that you had mentioned, I would argue, I mean, you, you posed your book as kind of going against the grain, um, right? And uh, I would argue that the tech lash that what we've seen um, out of the mainstream media, out of elite academia, um, has been somewhat of a form of um, equality washing. And um, that there is a, a position that they take, which it's considered to be anti big tech, but if you actually look at their solutions, they're rooted in capitalism, right? And there's a progressive capitalism. And at that point, um, you're, you're kind of still wetting yourself to the structure that's generating these problems and just pushing the idea that you can, you can fix them with the regulatory wand without having to do any real transformational work. And in particular, I have in mind here what I think has really taken over the political economy perspective of what we might call the tech left, um, which is the antitrust movement, right? Mm -hmm. There is, if you look into the literature, there is a heavy devotion to the idea that competition is a good thing. Whereas if you look through anybody who's looked through any socialist literature from the last 150 years, um, competition is seen as a, basically a destructive force, um, right? It pits people against each other. It's about winning. Um, and so, I mean, the and, and then we have some concrete things that I think are ignored. Uh, so if you, if you look at Margaret Vestager, who's uh, the EU's competitions are, she actually told the media that Europe needs to build its own tech giants, right? Mm. And the UK... Um, France, they've all been pushing the construction of their own unicorns, right? Uh, some Netherlands as well. And so, you know, that's, that's billion dollar corporations, right? So, I mean, as they're, they're, they're saying, oh, this big tech is evil. Uh, they're also simultaneously actually trying to build their own tech giants. Mm. And nobody even talks about that within the um, antitrust community. So, I mean, there's more to say about that. Um, but what is your take then on... Um, what's do what's seen as the tech clash and, and what's really the dominant ideas that are, are being pushed out there in the dominant narrative. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with this dominance of the antitrust agenda. Um, I think in mainstream discourse, there's also this kind of humanist critique of tech. So this is like the Tristan Harris, um, the Netflix show, The Social Dilemma, to a, a slightly lesser extent, Shoshana Zuboff, this idea that technology is like taking control of us, that where we've become rats in a cage, you know, little automatons that are like nudged by our social media accounts. And I think that's really big, right, as well, this idea that, that, that we need a more humane approach to technology. So this is kind of like the way you might talk about tech around the dinner table and these kind of casual conversations you're having. But you're right to say that um, at the governmental level in the kind of you know, policy circles, it's very much this idea of anti-monopoly. And it, it, it's like over the past five years, it has really come to dominate all discussion of technology such that any kind of regulatory measure that might be suggested ends up getting focused on how to restore competition to the tech sector. So the big problem is monopoly. The way to solve it is um, support small and medium businesses and um, place regulations on the companies to stop them both eating up and swallowing other companies. So um, a kind of uh, move against the conglomerate. So for example, Facebook purchasing WhatsApp and Instagram, um, but also creating the kind of regulatory mechanisms um, that prevent some of the big tech companies from stifling their competition. Um, and I think that the, the problem with this and, and one of the fundamental limitations I think that you've talked about um, is that it's not all about competition, right? If we are on the left and we're looking for non-market-based, commons-based, public-based solutions to these problems, and we're looking for ways in which we can organize digital services through these spheres, it can't all be about competition, right? Because competition essentially, and this is a problem that Nick Cernicek points out in his book, Platform Capitalism, um, the problem is there's that tech companies are structurally incentivized to behave in the way that they do. If you are a tech company and you are working in the data industry, 
um, you can't expect a company not to go after massive engagement, uh, reach, expansion, constantly trying to build the numbers, constantly trying to extract as much data as possible because they're a for-profit company. They're doing exactly what they were designed to do. Um, and so to, to say, oh, you just need to put the brakes on, your CEO needs to develop a conscience, that's missing the entire political economy of the sector, right? And so the fear is, let's say you break up the conglomerates. Let's say you promote a few European unicorns, maybe even some unicorns in the global south. The companies are going to behave in exactly the same way as before because they're going to be incentivized to crush their competitors, to build up as much data reserves as possible, to convert that into revenue through as many different ways as they can find. Um, and so what we really need is to move away from this myopic focus on competition and on breaking up monopolies and really think about what the main game is. And the main game is, of course, to, to find non-market solutions to the question of digital services, to start thinking about um, the free and open source software movement, um, to start thinking more about the way in which div digital services could be provided to everyone, that, that actually some of these things are public goods, not in the way that recent advocates of Web3 are talking about public goods as essentially privately owned services, not public goods that are just like accessible, public goods that are owned by communities, um, that, that we're not monetizing them constantly. So I think that's, that's really important. And um, from there, I think uh, we, really not, we, we really need to think more also um, about the kind of, I guess, cynicism and uh, you know, outright rejection of technology that, that has seeped into some parts of the left, right? It's, we can't just be about saying no to everything that comes this up. This kind we of Luddism. Well, I don't know. I say I'm, I'm quite close to the Luddites. So I feel, okay. <laughs> I feel quite, I feel, um, I've, I really enjoy a lot of their, their work and I've learned a lot from it. Um, and, and, and to be fair to some of the, the, the neo-Luddites, I'll just you know, mention, um, for example, Jathan Sadowski um, as, as someone who does attempt to put forward a, a, a kind of more positive proposal of how you can democratize technology. Um, and um, likewise with um, you know, Gavin Mueller's Breaking Things at Work, he also has some positive things to say at the end. But I think let's say a, a kind of naive Luddism or a Luddism that, that um, is only reading their Twitter posts, let's say, um, sometimes I think there's just this blanket cynicism that there are no alternatives that are possible, that, that anything you do is always going to be incorporated in, back into the system, right? So there's this kind of right. podium yeah. suspicion that because power is everywhere, resistance is, is useless, right? Um, and I think we need to, I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because I did want to give a, a slightly more optimistic, um, you know, dare I say utopian um, platform for different types of alternatives. I think one thing that the left really needs to do is start to explore more, invest in and experiment with alternative platforms from the dominant corporate ones that, that monopolize the marketplace. Yeah, and I think something else, you know, owing to this conversation on the tech left and what we've mistaken in our conversation is the larger conversation on digital colonialism you know, where mm -hmm. large tech corporations are actually controlling the political, economic, and social digital sphere of, you know, entire countries and continents. So I suppose another conversation we need to have before we get to our utopian future, and if we are mm -hmm. going to build our alternative technology on democratic means is, how, how do we address, you know, unequal exchange with regards to minerals and the very infrastructure that we're using to power our technologies? How do we make sure that this project to democratize the internet doesn't just get rested within a liberal Western sort of sphere of technology? And how, how do we create ways to include people in my part of the world, for instance? So platform socialism would need to extend itself internationally, you know? And uh, also, why do you think there's this aversion from the tech left, it almost seems as if the tech left is focusing so much on, okay, are algorithms racist, you know, rather mm -hmm. than the deeper structural problems that relates to whether or not people on our side of the world have any power and control over the technology that we're using? Yeah, it's a really important question. I think it's, so the international dimensions of technology and of the relationships between predominantly uh, tech companies in the global north and the communities that they exploit all across the world, 
um, is such an, an absolutely necessary and difficult task. I think that it's a real danger, as you point out, uh, to have you know something like platform socialism in one country, right? And I think you can see here a lot of the debates of the Green New Deal reflected in, in this kind of the, the danger of it becoming all about a kind of America first approach to, to, you know, trying to solve these issues. You can't neglect global supply chains because that's primarily what the tech empire um, is using, both in order to, to mine the minerals for their products, to assemble the products um, and to sell them as well. So um, it's really important that we uh, address these kinds of issues and, and to look at it at beyond the lens of a single nation state. Um, in the book, I, I start to address some of the ways in which we might be able to do that. Um, so one of the examples I suggest is that well, we could try to build towards some kind of global digital services organization, right? So that this might be able to operate at a more uh, international level. Um, and now I would put a small caveat here that I think it's really tricky to try and imagine forms of democracy and democratic government at an international level, because, precisely because uh, you know it, it, it's been so difficult to do in, in practice, right? That the United Nations is such an imperfect institution that it's been marred by you know its its history of the Cold War and and kind of dominance by by the global superpowers. But I think at the same time we need to start thinking about and really what I've done in my book is just try to point out some suggestions for, for, for you know, avenues that, that we could pursue for, for thinking about global common space forms of digital technology, that, that perhaps if we did have something like a global digital wealth fund, you know, I'm thinking about the kind of national wealth funds that exist in countries like Norway um, and where I'm from in Australia, that we might be able to start fund and develop um, and, and pay for developers to, to build these commons-based alternatives. One of the big limitations I think we've had is that all of these alternatives, um, you know, little things like Mastodon um, and um, Free, Freebox and Anytime someone tries to create something, it's always them working by themselves or with a small team and with practically no money. So I think we haven't even begun to experiment with what a, a better funded approach to some of these questions could be like, what it would really look like to invest in non-market-based alternatives to, to try and grow this commons. Um, and I think I'm really excited about that possibility, that what, what would it look like to kind of fund a public search engine or, you know, fund a, an alternative social media ecosystem. So I think, I think that is like, yeah, something, something worth talking about a lot more. Yeah. Can, can we not also get that capitalization from people, you know, and creating popular movements that put a lot of people investing what little capital they might have into alternatives in the long term? no longer having to invest in corporations, because uh, I see this idea of maybe a state-based sovereign fund or a global mm -hmm. fund, you know, you know, coming from the anarchist school of thought, we're really skeptical about whether or not states will allocate resources to public goods in the first place, you know, if you give them that authority. So, you know, what about people, you know, rising up and taking back power? Do you think that that's some kind of route that the tech left could take? I think that raises a really important point and a growing kind of division or at least point of tension uh, of people on the left in tech. There are some who really push for state-based solutions, right? So I'm thinking like maybe Paris Marx, I, in a lot of the articles that he's written, he's very adamant that, that the best approach to technology is going to come from, from state-financed and state-run projects. And so he turns often to things like Project Cybersyn in Chile in the 1970s, uh, to France's Minitel system in the, the 80s, I believe, um, paths that weren't quite taken in the Soviet Union, um, and these kinds of state-backed um, approaches. The benefits of this, I think, is, is are a few. Firstly, you, you know that you've got funding, right, because the state is an incredibly powerful actor that is going to adequately finance these kinds of projects, and it's a real benefit of this, and I think why it's such an easy option for the left to go to, that, you know, there's always the, the idea that we just need to take over power in the state and then we'll, we'll use it for progressive aims. And, and I think there's good reason for us to, to think that this might be one, one approach. Um, the a second reason why it is very um, tempting is because there are democratic mechanisms built into the state, however imperfectly they operate, that gives you structures of accountability. So 
um, there, there are ways in which you can hold members of parliament to account, right? You can vote them out, you can vote the political party out. There is, you know, if it's a state solution um, and state-backed solution, then we have an, a degree of democracy there, right? Um, if you turn A little to, degree. A little degree, right. <laughs> okay, we, we all know how imperfectly it operates, particularly in, in America, um, but also elsewhere, right? That democracy is a kind of work in progress and, you know, it's actually kind of regressing in many places around the world. Um, but you can see why, you know, in in in, in like contrast to like a private company, there's something there. It's not just the Zook making unilateral decisions about what's going on. Um, now, why couldn't we turn to communities? Why couldn't we turn to individuals? I think this is another uh, important approach and it's perhaps something that, that is really also sought by this new movement of Web3 advocates, right? People who uh, are kind of looking to ways we could decentralize um, the, the tech sector to build new projects in which everyone will own digital tokens. And, and this is kind of really goes into what you were saying, right? That why can't everyone kind of, you know, crowdfund alternatives? Um, now, I think this is, this is another possibility. I think one of the limitations with this is that the risk is that big um, corporate interests will come to dominate a, 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 as well. Um, precisely because they're the ones with all the money to finance these kinds of things. The benefit, though, is that maybe, you know, that maybe we can move a lot faster as small communities. Maybe there are actually things that a, a state in its current form would never authorise, that actually many of the states are, uh, you know, in um, working in collaboration with some of these big companies, that so they have no intention of funding not-for-profit, community-driven alternatives. So we shouldn't wait for, for you know, state-backed solutions because they may never arrive. And, and as you've already alluded to, you know, some of the big, um, you know, people in these regulatory roles simply want um, to, you know, have a little bit more competition in the sector, but basically have things run as they are. Um, so I think there is kind of strengths and weaknesses with both approaches. The, the, one of the alternatives I kind of talk much more about in the book um, is this idea of a, a much more libertarian anti-statist um, tendency within the left. And, and I kind of go back to be, you know, from a UK perspective, I go back to people like the Guild Socialists and the early Fabian Society and, and the debates that were happening there um, to really try to revive um, a much more community driven and, and local um, form of decision making that, that really turns to some of these more federated and decentralized alternatives as a way of thinking about how we could rethink some of these tech services. Yeah, and and when you say libertarian, there you mean libertarian socialist, right? Yeah. Which you discuss in the book, not not right wing libertarianism, which no, is, no, course, is a very no, different no. thing, right? Yeah, I should I should yeah. should be careful with how I use that. So there there's a kind of like lesser known um, libertarian socialist strand who are people who are basically on the left that uh, can be critical of the overly centralized tendencies of some aspects of left-wing politics. So of course, the classic example is the kind of anarchist critique of Marxists. Um, but, you know, in the, on the UK left, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, you get people who are kind of critical of the really overly bureaucratic state-led forms of nationalization that people like the Fabian Society were advocating for at the end of the 19th and beginning of 20th century. There are many really diverse little groups of libertarian socialists, but it's essentially a way of talking about um, slightly more left-wing socialists that, that are focusing on local decision-making, um, often have an emphasis on federal structures or councils and, and how they might operate and who are critical of these kind of more bureaucratic top-down forms of nationalization. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, when we're talking about something like, say, nationalization, so you have mentioned um, Paris Marx and Mike Davis, some other people have said, why don't we nationalize Amazon? And personally, I have a, a, an issue with that. And, um, my issue would be is that you're basically giving Amazon over to the American empire, right? And, at, you know, at that point, if, if you look at, um, I think Paris, I mentioned the, the post office, but you look at the post office, what do they do? They spy on people's mail. They spy on, on, on social media. Came out last year that USPS is spying on social media accounts. Um, it has a long history of doing that. And it, 
um, they're unionized, but they've treated their workers extremely poorly, not paying them, all sorts of things like that. And if you look at the history of nationalization, um, say in the United States, uh, it's it's usually connected to war. It doesn't actually ever have a real um, humanitarian connection. And so, you know, if we're looking at something like, say, tech won't save us, it's also kind of like, this is too easy. Politicians won't save us either, right? Like, it's not going to come th that easy. And um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a really naive thing. I mean, technically speaking, it might be a little better than having Amazon as a private corporation, but this isn't really an actual left-wing socialist oriented solution, right? Um, so, because it's not, it's to just nationalize like that, you need to put it into the hands of workers if it's to be socialist, right? And you, you, and you need to put it under the control of communities as well. Um, so one of the things that you discuss in your book um, is a different uh, view on political economy, which is a kind of libertarian socialism or socialism from below. And you uh, make use of uh, GDH coal, right? Um, so you, can you, you know, can you tell me uh, us a little bit about what his kind of vision was and, and how it could potentially relate to tech? Yeah, no worries. So I think, you know, this idea that tech won't save us, politicians won't save us, um, strikes at this really fundamental problem of where do you base political authority? Where do you base political power? What is a more democratic form of organizing this? Because as you say, like it, it's, there are, there are no easy options, right? There, there's no, um, to give power to the workers, um, it, it, in itself um, is is difficult to know how that would actually work out in practice, right? Because if you give if you give Google um, or, or Amazon, for example, rather than giving it to the post office or the government, if you give it to Google's hundred thousand employees, then you've got a hundred. You know, you're giving it over to the American workers, but but only a hundred thousand of them. Nobody who is a volunteer or does care work. Nobody who is working in some other industry or some other company. So it, structurally and institutionally, it's very hard to know. Um, what to do. And so we can say things like, well, one of the problems with top-down nationalization is that you often get distant bureaucrats in charge of these services and nothing changes in practice. Um, you know, one of the, the, the weaknesses of saying something like, oh, give it over to the workers or the community is that, well, that in some sense can be equally problematic because you don't get society or even global society to, to make it even more difficult um, to have any say in how that operates. So what we're really, you know, the real problem that we're trying to address here is how do we create new democratic structures that will enable people to exercise control over the digital services that they use for their everyday lives? Um, and so this is an incredibly complex um, question. And I do turn to the ideas of, of G.D.H. Colt, who was a guild socialist. He's writing in the early 20th century, because I think reviving his ideas gives us some new ways in which to rethink the governance of digital platforms, right? So just very briefly, Cole is a kind of member of the Fabian Society, who is very big on the British left. They helped found the British Labour Party. Um, but he, he becomes more critical of the Fabian's uh, tendency to think very much in, in centralised forms of top-down state-led nationalisation. And so what Cole really emphasises is an idea of worker self-government, that we need to have local decision-making at the level of the workplace, um, and that the way in which we organise um, political life has to be in a much more participatory way. So his kind of vision of, of what he uh, imagined for a guild socialist society um, we could also call it a kind of associational socialism. I know that's like a bit of a mouthful, but the reason for this is he really wants to de-emphasize the role of the state and to bring up a series of intermediary associations, things like our workplaces, maybe places of worship, sporting institutions, cultural institutions, the kind of places we spend a lot of our time, the kinds of organizations we live in and that have a really big uh, impact on our lives. And he thought these should have internally democratic structures, that we should be able to have a say in how they operate, right? Especially the workplace, that's a form of economic democracy. So people should be able to elect representatives, have a direct say in how organizations work. And his vision was for a participatory society in which the role of the state is diminished 
and overlapping producer, consumer and municipal associations take primary role for coordinating social life. Um, so it's a kind of very different idea of how social life might, might be organized. Um, it was one that was kind of slightly to the left or even of the kind of Fabians and the, the mainstream British left at the time. But the idea here is that we should be able to have a say in how the organizations operate um, and the way in which you can apply this to the world of digital platforms is to turn your mind to the kind of function that the platforms perform, right? So there are different types of communities on different types of platforms. And we really need to think of the diverse ecosystem of different alternative ownership models that we could start to implement over digital platforms. And so I think one of the ways I try to approach this, you know, tricky question of which types of publics will govern digital platforms is to say, well, we need an ecosystem. There's no one size fits all. You can't just say, oh, the workers of the platform should be the only ones who govern them. And I don't think you can either say, oh, the, the, the national government should be the only one uh, that, that governs the platforms. I think you look at the platforms, you look at the scale at which they're best operating, and you implement what you know is a principle of subsidiarity. The platform should be operated the most local and proximate level that would enable it to be done so um, in a way that it is most effective and sustainable. So I think we need structures of democratic governance that reflect the kind of communities that are using each of the platforms. And I don't really see another way in which you could approach that and still call it democratic, right? I don't think every nationalizing everything would work and nor do i think that turning everything over to the workers themselves would work precisely for the the problems i just pointed out and so cole um and and others who i draw on in the book have what is called a pluralist approach to, to democratic governance they think that there isn't this one size fits all approach and that you really have to look at the different kinds of communities that that, that are using them yeah, it sounds like you're talking a bit about the structure of a cooperative, which can be fluid based on need, context, scale, which can have different stakeholders. You might even have cooperatives that temporarily involve some of the capitalist corporations, but with the future vision of eradicating them and moving toward entirely democratic structures. You have cooperatives that are, you know, made up of other cooperatives. So, you know, is, is that more or less the kind of structure we're, we're looking at? You know, you already have some tech-based cooperatives right now. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we'll get more of that? Do you think that's the way or the vehicle that moves us toward this ecosystem kind of world? Yeah, I think, you know, what we call now platform cooperatives will be a really important part of the future. But I just, I do want to emphasize that it, it will kind of be a cooperatives plus model, right? Because let's take a few concrete examples to make it a bit um, more easy to, to, to kind of envision. So let's say we have like a local courier service of, of people riding on bikes, delivering maybe food or maybe other packages um, to, to their local neighborhood or, you know, maybe a small city. This is the kind of thing that we could definitely envision as, as a workers cooperative. A workers cooperative is, is like an organization in which the workers who work there directly own and govern and receive profits from the business that they're operating, right? So it's if I if if us three had a little courier service and we started working, you know, our area, we would all equally divide the, the benefits of, of the value that we produce, and we would democratically work together to organize the structure of the business to work out our work schedules, how we would engage with customers. This is like a workers' cooperative, right? That's This is a really good part. There's one that I work with in my area, a, a food delivery service called Wings. And they're an alternative to like Uber Eats and Deliveroo. You know, they run entirely like eco-friendly service. They're um, dividing um, the, the benefits of that equally with, the, with other members of the cooperative. It's one important ingredient of moving towards new forms of social ownership. Um, but let's take Google as an example. Uh, you know, if we think of like the search engine that they run, it wouldn't make sense. I don't think it would be democratically um, beneficial to, to turn Google into a workers' cooperative. And one of the reasons is that it's profoundly unjust on other non-members of Google, right? And this is what this is what many of the socialists in the what's now called the socialization debates realize. You know, when 
these when, when this kind of option was a genuine possibility, and this is going way back to like 1918, you know, uh, Europe, right? So Germany, Austria, a few other countries, when people are talking about potentially the fall of capitalism, potentially the ways in which workers might govern some of these structures, it was, it was readily acknowledged that it couldn't just be local businesses. Um, and the more powerful the business, the more this would be the case. Um, who would have ownership and control over the services. So while I think cooperatives would make a really important um, part of this ecosystem, the reason why I call it an ecosystem and not simply platform cooperativism um, is because I think it would also need to be combined with other forms of governance. And I think you can't get away from the fact that this would have to be both at the municipal level, so cities, um, and in the book, I give the example of like a ride hail service and um, a short term rental accommodation service that I think would probably be best operated at a city level by something like a, a city or a regional government, but also thinking at the national and international level. And that kind of goes back to your previous point about American empire and global inequalities and in how tech is deployed across the world, right? Because it can't just be about Americans. I mean, if we did turn every tech company into a workers cooperative, it would literally just be Americans deciding on everything for the rest of the world. And you're right to say that that would potentially be an improvement over, um, I don't know, the American Secret Services deciding on everything, the CIA. But at the same time, you, you would still have this profound injustice there. So I think what is both incredibly difficult but incredibly necessary is thinking about new forms of international federations that we might be able to develop, right? And I think that's why the federal structure is so important because what a federal structure does is it, it allows individual nodes to have a degree of autonomy while still retaining retaining some kind of coordination with a larger whole. And I think the precise way in which you do that is very difficult, right? I don't claim to have all the answers of how an international democratic government could, could function, but I think it's something we need to talk about more because I think when you get to the level of like, you know, let's say a, a search engine, right? You know, and we absolutely need a not-for-profit, public, non-commercial search engine that will allow people to access the world's knowledge in the same way that Wikipedia runs as a, as, as a foundation. We need something like that for search engines, but we need it to be, to, to have the kinds of openness and discussion about the principles that would govern such a service, about the kinds of algorithms it would use, how it would generate results, how it would personalize these kinds of results, but we need that to be a democratic discussion. And I don't even think we've started to think about what that might look like in practice. Yeah. And, you know, if you're looking at um, going back to, or, or staying with the uh, core of political economy, which is, is, is what we're talking about, right? Um, you have proposals, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Michael Albert and Robin Hanel and their participatory economics. Um, we want to have uh, you know one of them on the show at some point and to discuss um, what they've been working on for 30 years as building a concrete alternative to capitalism that doesn't require state socialism, right? Um, and uh, it's a non-market system that they have in mind. And they built that because uh, a lot of socialists don't like capitalism, but they don't have a positive vision for what it is they want, right? And that goes back to what you were saying early in your book about Marx saying that he doesn't have uh, or bother with uh, kitchen recipes for the, for the future, right? The idea that why try to map out what it is we want because we know what we don't want and we, we could just get there um, if we have a, a, an anti-capitalist um, you know, pro-worker movement. And, and so like the thing is, um, I think that if we're looking at some of these infrastructures, so it wouldn't just be the problem that American workers uh, are in control of now of Google search and, you know, um, Microsoft Azure or whatever it is, but you also have, we have an issue of uh, capital and physical infrastructures, right? So one of the things that were that has happened is a lot of these cloud centers and data warehouses have been built in wealthy countries. And so if there and let's say you have a new campus, uh, Apple opens a new research campus and it's worth whatever, a billion dollars. And it's being built in Texas, 
Well, I mean, that's an expensive facility. Now, what do you do with that? Under the U.S. Constitution, you have eminent domain. You're not going to just seize that property uh, constitutionally without compensation to the owners. Uh, so there's a question of whether or not the constitutions that we have at the state level are actually adequate and sufficient to social justice. Um, second of all, you have a lot of this physical infrastructure, which is really valuable, and it's concentrated in the global north. Um, so the question becomes, well, why do they get to just keep this, right? And what should, be, what should be done about that? Now, that would require some sort of international coordination, as you're saying, right? We have to actually take serious internationalism and reparations. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, where I sit on this question is, yeah, I mean, I think that we could start putting together ingredients that have always been there within a left-wing socialist, anti-authoritarian socialist, um, you know, um, uh, movement and with federalism, worker cooperatives, um, you know, things like that. And uh, community councils, can, so uh, Albert and Hanel talk about not just uh, workers' councils to, for collective decision-making, but also uh, consumer, consumer councils to help democratically uh, plan what to produce and how much and who gets access to what. Um, so on that question, uh, you have mentioned, um, uh, I think it was um, iterative planning, right? Yeah, um, and that's part of what uh, Hanel and, and Albert are working on. So can you talk a little bit um, about democratic planning uh, in, in that, you, you know, using that kind of um, procedure? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so this idea that we shouldn't just have workers' councils, we should also have consumer councils, you know, this is taken straight out of you know, not in a bad way, but like this is this is one of Cole's principles that you actually needed to balance the rights of different groups in society. There could be a conflict of interest uh, that, that could develop there. Um, and democratic planning is going to be a really important part of this. And I also think um, thinking in concrete and positive terms about the kinds of institutions that will uh, make up a socialist economy and a socialist society is incredibly important. And you know, just to go back to your point about Marx and using that as a launch pad, um, you know, I think we we sh we have a right to be skeptical of what some people call Marx's utopophobia, that his his emphasis that um, the workers themselves would be the one to decide on on what was uh, what would be the future you know state of a, of a socialist society. I, I think we can support that principle and say, yes, of course, workers themselves should decide. Um, but we shouldn't let it like completely um, deny us the right to have any kind of sense of what's to follow, right? I think it's gone a little too far in the other direction, uh, particularly from Marxists who follow him, that there's literally just no discussion of what these kinds of economies will look like. What will people be doing? What kinds of institutions will there be? And I think one of the, the goals of this book is, is just to make a small contribution towards envisioning what some of these organizations might look like. What would they do in practice? And um, so that was really important to me, right? To have, to contribute to some kind of emerging you know, experimental idea of, of what might come. Because I think we do need to kind of give more concrete life um, to this notion of uh, what a socialist economy would look like. Now, central to this, as you pointed out, is some idea of democratic planning. And, and the reason for this is because once you're moving away from market mechanisms to determine price and to allocate goods, and once you're saying that you're not happy, essentially with a handful of billionaires making decisions about how the majority of the world's goods are going to be allocated through investment decisions, you need democratic processes to decide this, right? And this is the real move of democratic planning. It's to say that not only our politics, but also the investment of our finite and scarce resources should be something that's decided by everyone. And, you know, planning is, is thinking about the mechanisms through which we can start to have more democracy, uh, not only at our place of work, but over these big picture questions. And in order to address these um, ideas, I turn both to Cole, but also to another um, kind of contemporary of his, uh, an Austrian philosopher and economist called Otto Neurath. Um, I was first introduced to Neurath through um, 
Aaron Beninev, who's the author of um, Automation, the Future of Work. And then we had like a reading group on it. And um, the more I started to read some of these things, the more resonance there was with some of the other socialist thinkers that I was looking at from this period. Um, and one of Otto Neurath's big ideas is that he thought that the, the way in which we would tackle big system level challenges um, you know, and today we could think about things like climate change, you know, global pandemics, all of this, that the way in which we do that is to establish democratic processes um, over investment decisions. Um, and that it was only through having this rational deliberation that we could start to think more in, concretely about long-term industrial strategy, you know, economic strategy. How much do we, you know, how, how many resources do we devote to different sectors and, and what would that look like? Um, and there's, there's quite a few, you know, things here. I'll just touch on two points very quickly. Um, the first point is that, you know, this is going to, going to involve very political questions that economic planning and democratic planning isn't simply about trying to optimize for efficiency in production. Um, it's about deciding on different forms of life, right? Because, you know, if we if we have a kind of static equilibrium, we could try and imagine how we would balance consumer uh, demand with the you know supply available from the producer cooperatives. But actually, in reality, we we actually just need to make decisions about where we want to invest our money. How much do we want to devote to green energy, for example? How you know do we need to set necessary upper limits to how much energy we consume? What kinds of products are we going to produce? So at a very big picture global level, there needs to be fundamental um, questions about the kind of society we want to produce based on the investment decisions, because really nothing could be more fundamental to the, the form of society that we have, to the cultures that get produced in it, than thinking about these, you know, billions and billions of dollars and how they're going to get invested. And so Neurath imagines there to be um, and, and really wants us to create a, a, a blueprint or a vision. And he sees planning as a way of doing that, that we need some kind of democratic process to have a vision for a particular way of life. And that when you're thinking about big picture issues, we should not leave this to the marketplace. We shouldn't leave this to, to billionaires that are always just trying to um, increase their wealth um, and, and creating all the negative ex externalities in the process. Um, we need to be able to make conscious decisions about how that would happen. Um, and the second, the second quick thing I wanted to bring up <clears throat> was that um, when we think about how this planning can take place, I think it's really important also to, to point out that this doesn't mean that every single thing in society will be centrally determined, right? It's it doesn't have to take the model of the centrally planned economies of the Soviet Union. I think this is a really important point. Um, in the book, I talk about needing to develop forms of participatory planning that are going to happen also at a more local or decentralized level. And, and in this respect, um, I am very close to the, the Paracon projects that, that you, know, you mentioned before, this participatory economics. Um, and, and I think it's really working within that same framework. Um, I don't follow kind of every precise um, prescription they have about work complexes and other things, but I think they're kind of pointing roughly in the right direction, right? I don't think we can kind of know every aspect of how that might work, but I, I think we need to start talking about the kinds of structures that might be in place to do that. So I think we, you know, it's it's a matter of, um, and so Neurath talks about indicative planning, the kind of planning that will, will set quotas, that might set an upper limit, that might kind of give you a general direction of you know, we're going to have 30 billion here, we're going to have 50 billion there, while leaving a degree of autonomy when it comes to maybe how goods would be produced, the kinds of goods that might be produced, that, you know, basically an indicative plan that, that allows room for manoeuvre and, and room for coordination and negotiation at a, at a more local level. And this is why, once again, you know, I find myself always returning to this kind of more federalist approach where you kind of have a degree of coordination, but not in the sense that, that you know, you turn to a factory and you say, you have to produce X number of goods. They have to be, you know, the blue shoes in this style, that that's probably not going to be how it works. And so I start to um, look at economists like Pat Devine, for example, who has this idea of participatory planning through negotiated coordination, 
there are a few other people in this space kind of putting forward some some interesting ideas about this but this is kind of the the kind of democratic planning that that i imagine and that i kind of put forward in the book yeah and i just want to uh, mention that samo had to uh duck out early so um it's just he's still now. a fan he's still a fan of democratic planning he's just, <laughs> he didn't leave in disgust yeah <laughs> we actually have mentioned that before we we started airing um so yeah i mean uh so there are uh, obviously there are proposals there with uh in indicative planning and um and the way Hanel and Albert uh, describe it is that you have people who are, you're basically having people communicate what it is that they want uh, with the budgets they have or, or whatnot, and that you go through some rounds, you can update it as time goes on, you can come up with ways of refining this. This way, there's a kind of sense of um, what people's priorities are and what needs to be produced and, and in how much. And then you can build in processes to adapt it if things change, right? Like all of a sudden, you know, demand changes or all of a sudden the conditions of production change. So you need to have some sort of mechanism built in uh, so that you can adapt uh, because you're making plans, say, for a year, but um, things might change, right? So you have um, definitely um, different views or visions for an alternative to capitalism. And this doesn't get much play when you come down to it. I think what we see with a lot of socialist thinking is often just simply anti-capitalism. And I think it's really important that we do start looking at these things because at the end of the day, there are limitations to what we should expect to get if we stay within the structures that we have. One of the things that I've been pushing personally and I've written about recently is the idea of a digital tech deal. There are some people who have also put out ideas of a digital new deal, but I personally took the, the new out of it to avoid association with FDR, right? And that was inspired by the Red Deal, indigenous persons who are pushing for a change to the economy that's environmentally friendly, but that is radical left. And really what that means is egalitarian, right? But the idea here would be is I don't think that we can actually fix what's going on with tech without a more comprehensive plan, right? So there has to be a more comprehensive agenda because there are too many intersecting parts. Let me give a case example here. If you're looking at something like decentralized social media and you're looking at the Fediverse and you're looking at Mastodon and for anyone who might not know what that is, it's a set of social networks that are that will talk to each other. And the premise behind that is that if the social media networks talk to each other, you're not stuck inside one platform you can join just one service and you can still talk to other people and they make it easy so that new mini social networks can basically be built by communities at very low cost. So the issue there, one of the issues there is you still have things like copyright, right? So if you're hosting content, you have to police this out and it's, and it's not really, equitable to have a copyright system in place when half the world's people don't have any disposable income, right? So plus on top of that, if you want to have hosting services so that you can host your own social media network, you have to have income and infrastructure to get it done, right? So and I'm thinking globally here. I'm thinking when people are living on $3 a day or less, right? But they might have access to a little smartphone or, or, or a computer. So there's a lot of things that kind of intersect in here that reinforce the, the power in the status quo. And I don't think it's going to really be easy to, to really build a socialist solution without having a more holistic view of, of the way these things intersect and without having a more comprehensive plan to try to simultaneously attack all these power vectors and make them work together so that you have an actual cohesive 
socialist ecosystem. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, something that's really important is that we, we start to look at a big picture. And I think that needs to be put into an eco-socialist framework because everything ha you know, falls within the limits of growth. And so even when we're looking at something like tech workers, I, I want to ask you about this um, for a second. And then, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about some um, solutions that are there, some that you review in your book, and, and we'll wrap up the episode that way. So if we're looking at things like tech, tech workers, because you have mentioned them in your book towards the end, I have some apprehension. Not, it's not that I don't, I don't like unionizing uh, big tech. But to me, it's kind of like unionizing the East India companies, right? Like, or Raytheon. It doesn't seem like it really is um, anything that's good beyond those workers themselves. Um, but um, also, it seems like a lot of these tech workers, I mean, look, we'd, ra we'd rather have them seeing things the way I, th I think that needs to be seen if we're to be, like, for example, sustainable. But if you're making $250,000 a year and you're a tech worker, then you're consuming more than your um, sustainable share and your fair share. So the stuff that the $250,000 you get, that's a median salary in a lot of big tech companies. Well, now you take that money and it's a claim on other people's labor. So you go buy coffee from the store and that doesn't come from nowhere. It doesn't fall from the sky. It comes from labor. And so now it's people halfway across the world are making, say, a dollar an hour, and you're being able to consume massive amounts of labor time of other people. And so really, um, within a degrowth framework, that's not sustainable. But if we're to go beyond that, we, we can also say it's an unequal exchange and that they should be campaigning to reduce their, their incomes. And I'm, I'm not so sure that a lot of tech workers are really gonna be down for that kind of cause. It seems to me more that they're picking a few things like don't sell military, don't provide tech services to Saudi Arabia or the Israeli government. And, you know, but it's against our company's vision that they say that we're gonna be good, but it's like, yeah, but your companies can't be good. Um, so what is your take on, uh, tech workers. And what do you think about that kind of way of looking at it? Well, I think you express some, you know, like understandable skepticism towards a very perhaps privileged class of, of people and the, the kind of change that might be effective within the structures that exist. Also, and I just want to say real quick yeah, that yeah, I don't but, mean we're warehouse workers or gig workers. Yeah, I mean, well, like I was, the kind I was of, about to just yeah. say that, yeah. um, you know, tech workers, if we understand the term more broadly, might include, you know, multiple intersecting layers, right? So it might be janitorial staff, it might be warehouse workers, it might be um, people who are kind of adjacent to these companies, but in outsourced companies, essentially. So, uh, you know, any kind of like data cleaning or stuff like that, that might happen. So there are kind of multiple tiers within the tech worker industry. And um, the fact that some of them are getting paid kind of what, what, you know, many people consider to be extraordinary wages. I don't think that's an argument against them unionizing, right? That's, that's an argument for unionization plus more thoroughgoing changes to the economy. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, I think you, have some valid concerns and 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 criticisms. Um, I think it's it's almost too early to tell in the tech sector what strategies will be most effective and and um, and and which ones should be supported. I think in the book, I really wanted to emphasize that it has to come from both inside and outside, right? I don't think it it will be possible to to unilaterally force a hand of, all Google's employees and all, all the software engineers and to basically make out like that, that it's like an us versus them um, battle when really we want the software developers and the engineers to be on side, right? Like it's kind of a travesty that like the gaming and IT community has for whatever reason become quite right wing and quite libertarian um, because they're some of the most exploited by capitalism, right? And they're, they're like both at the coalface of 
um, the, the current recent transformations of global capitalism, um, but also potentially some of the strongest advocates or potentially some of the strongest advocates for change. So I think we need tech workers on site. We need to convince people that um, the tech industry does need unionization, that they're not these kinds of like individualistic savants that, that don't need unions or that, that, you know, they're somehow in this world beyond the need for collective power and collective action. Um, in terms of the kinds of actions that tech worker collectives have done, um, I think there is some benefit to this kind of media first approach of like, putting the spotlight on something the company has done, right? That it's not necessarily the same thing um, as, as building or, or working from worker grievances at a more local level. I think there might be some potential for diversity of tactics approach. But I do agree with you that, that it's like, I, I think there are better places to look if we want examples of like strong unions, you know, workplace organizing. Um, tech workers have only very recently kind of come to the table and it's not necessarily being done in, in the best way possible, but I think we need to be supportive and encouraging of approaches and, and things that are happening in that sector because it is still really early days um, and, and small victories and, and small um, kind of wins on a PR level could potentially lead to, to, to bigger and better forms of organizing. Everyone's on their own journey. So I think that's really important to, to talk about that. But I guess the important point is it can't end at that local level. It can't end just at, at a union being formed. I think there can't be any platform socialism without more thoroughgoing socialism throughout the economy, right? And so I can only really see um, any of these kinds of experiments working off the back um, of a, a kind of broader political movement of social movements and political parties that would support this, right? And it, when we start turning to some of the concrete examples, um, you know, which we'll hopefully do so in a second. If you think about decode, um, decentralized citizen owned data ecosystems, that was a, a project that was trialed in Barcelona and Amsterdam. This came off the back of a, a very participatory left wing mayor taking office in, in Barcelona. And it was on the basis of a kind of promise of, of bringing social movements in. Um, that's when you get this kind of new municipalism approach of like changing the way power operates and, and give decentralizing power, making it more accessible for people to have a say in how their city operates. Um, so I think you're right to say that, that there are limitations with certain strategies. I think we should still be supportive of, of them when we find them, um, but that we do need, as you suggest, this broader approach that looks much more critically about broader questions of power, uh, of political economy, um, and, and really trying to create these strong movements for change that are, that are trying to address things at a much deeper level. Yeah, and I mean, look, I would say, I would say back to that, though, that I still have some issues there. Right. So, for example, um, if you're looking at unionizing Google, um, it could just give the kind of veneer that Google could be somehow progressive. Right. And if you're looking at unionization also, I mean, one place is the World Socialist website that has covered uh, critical uh, takes on unionization in a kind of bureaucratized form that actually kind of zaps. Uh, uh, the idea of a socialist oriented orientation for workers and instead draws them into negotiations with the bosses for things like wages and a capitalist vision of what the economy should be. So it could be seen as uh, if it's not a kind of socialist oriented process, it could be seen as a form of co-optation. And I think that's criticism's not there. It's not even discussed. And if you look at the Biden administration, which is supporting, um, you know, am some of the Amazon workers for their, their quest for unionization and things like that, they're doing it for a reason. They want to contain the, the uh, workers that are looking to do things um, through, through the union pro unionization process that is acceptable to the Biden administration. And while I'm not, of course, against forming a union to do things like get, get better wages, and it's always supportable. I think that uh, some of this uh, part of the, the issue is lost. And I do think that you do see it clearly in some of the messages that the, that the workers are putting out there. So for example, with Netflix and, and um, 
uh, Dave Chappelle and the transphobia. Yeah, OK, I, I support what a lot of those workers were asking for, but they're also pushing this notion that Netflix is there to entertain the world. And then you have comrades of mine in Africa who are saying Netflix is coming over and colonizing us. So it's like, no, like you can't actually push that kind of message out. It, it does do damage in my view. So I'm happy to see people pushing back against transphobia, of course, on Netflix, but you can't also simultaneously say that Netflix is, you know, violating its, its, you know, quest to entertain the world. That's not what Netflix does. And it's actually harming a lot of people. And there's no, if there's no acknowledgement of that and no attention to that, you know, I, I don't think that that's, uh, I think that that could be viewed as problematic, but let's, Let's move on to the um, and close out here to some of the examples that that you give in in the book um, about concrete examples of things that are built right now that I think for you, if I'm correct here, uh, could be seen as projects that are consistent with platform socialism. Yeah, OK, well, um in the book, I kind of draw on both existing prototypes and kind of my own ideas of how, you know, these organizations could, could op operate. I think there's lots of like platform cooperatives, just to start with a, a very concrete example um, of, you know, organizations that, that are trying to have a degree of social ownership um, and organize the political economy in a slightly different way. Um, I already mentioned the example of the food delivery cooperative where I'm from in London called Wings. It's like alternative to Deliveroo. We could think about organizations like Fair B and B, which is a group of you know predominantly European organizations. I think the main people are kind of based in Italy and France, if I remember correctly. Um, but I think they're operating in five countries. And what they're doing is trying to create a platform for hosts to be able to run a degree of short-term rental services, um, but to do so within the framework of a platform cooperative and to start to develop these kinds of multi-stakeholder forms of, of ownership and governance so that you know, nodes in each city and communities in each city can have some kind of say over the rules that, are, that are exist on the platform and that share in some of the value that's created there. So the fees are much, much lower than, than on the corporate platforms. It's essentially just enough to you know, run the bare mechanics of the platform and any of the extra fees basically go to community projects in the local city. So you have hosts that are running them, you have a one host, one house rule. So it's not used as a kind of commercial um, tool of speculation where in you know, Airbnb today, um, you know, I think more than 50% of hosts in some cities are now running multiple properties. You know, it's, it's basically like a business and for some like a very profitable business, people with like 100 houses, they're taking them off the long term rental market, jacking up property prices, um, creating these like housing clones, where people come in and you know, it's just the same thing, no matter where you are in the world. Um, and so Fairbnb is kind of giving you a concrete example of, of how that might be done differently, right? Um, I also think there, there are um, important kind of prototypes of different ways in which people are kind of trying to create data commons. So, the, you know, the way in which we could collect data for explicitly for a kind of civic purpose um, and to, to provide a public good. Because I think the idea of like um, collecting data has kind of taken this really negative, sinister um, turn precisely because corporate you know, um, entities are, are doing so in, in very exploitative ways, you know, this idea of surveillance capitalism and, and people basically just using it to, to sell consumer insights to, to third parties. But it doesn't have to be that way. I think there are ways in which we can create data ecosystems like that decode project I was telling you about. And, you know, Francesca Bria is someone that I think has done some really interesting stuff over the past five or 10 years. Um, particularly with these um, projects and, and a couple of others. Um, and, you know, this is an idea that you, a city, could develop the kinds of um, sensor networks um, that could gather data on things like transport and energy use and, and noise pollution and things like that, that they could be used for creating public good, that they could be kind of created and, and stored in a kind of data commons. Um, and Decode was one of those projects it allowed neighborhoods to basically decide on priorities for what they wanted to do, for what issues they cared about. 
Um, and it was really trying to pilot um, ways in which you could have privacy enhanced data sharing to create public value so that people could basically decide to opt in or opt out which parts of the, the service they wanted to. Um, it could provide people with, uh, you know, an idea of identity management. Um, and I think this is kind of part of like a, what's called the new municipalism movement. Um, and they kind of had their coming out party at a um, uh, Fearless Cities Network meeting in Barcelona in 2017. And it's really thinking about how we can enhance local democracy, how we can develop these new kind of institutions at a local level. Um, and devolving power away both from the really big corporations, but also from the kind of security state nexus. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in these kinds of democratic projects to enhance uh, citizens' control over technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and I, I agree with you that I think that we should be supporting these kinds of projects in, instead of seeing seeing um i mean sometimes you see like overly grand claims about maybe what they could do <laughs> yeah um for sure. but even even despite that right like that um you have mentioned freedom box they have like two full-time developers yeah right? exactly you know and it's just like instead of saying this is tech solutionism maybe we should be trying to support these while we hit on multiple cylinders right like and that's why i, I loved about your book you did a fantastic job bringing people through everything from from what's wrong with big tech platforms to what how it could be different traditional political economy and concrete solutions. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for coming on the show today. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure to talk about the book. Yeah, and um, platform socialism by James Muldoon. It's out on Pluto Press, and I highly recommend it. So once again, James, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much.